Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you are joining us from. This is Dr. Vijay Agarwal. I'm the president of CAHO, Consortium of Accredited Healthcare Organizations, welcoming you to this fourth episode of the international webinar series, which is jointly hosted by CAHO and ISQA. We have, in fact, the pleasure of the president of ASQA, Dr. Ravindran Jagasoti, also being present with us. So we welcome you also, sir, here. To moderate this session, we have Dr. Sahadullah, M.I. Sahadullah. He is the founder, chairman, and managing director of Kim's Healthcare Management Limited, a public limited company formed in 1996 with a vision to establish a healthcare institution with a difference, adopting the best of the global quality standards. His experience in healthcare sector ranges over an impressive 40 years, spanning across several countries such as India, UK, Saudi Arabia, USA, and other countries of the Middle East. Dr. Sadullah is a recipient of many awards and laurels from various organizations within the country and abroad. But more than anything else, my dear friends, Dr. Sadallah is the patron of CAHO, Consortium of Accredited Healthcare Organization, and the organizing chairman of the forthcoming CAHOCON, which is going to be hosted in his city of Kochi on 24th, 25th, and 26th of September. So I invite Dr. Sadullah to introduce the topic as well as our esteemed speakers from abroad and it's a great pleasure for us to have you all here. Thank you, and over to Dr. Sadullah. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Um, it was a very generous introduction. Um, uh, good evening and uh, good morning, as he said, um, to the various participants from various parts of the world. Um, it's a privilege for me to introduce um, two internationally acclaimed, um, you know, um, uh, speakers and um, our um, um, session. This is uh, between ISQA and uh, CAHO um, webinar. Uh, this is the fourth webinar. And the clinical communication in challenging situations is the subject. A couple of words about the subject. I think uh, the, in spite of um, uh, the explosion of information technology and um, in now the information is available easily for all of us. The communication still remains uh, uh, a lot to be improved, especially clinical communication um, is, uh, is the most effective tool in establishing an interpersonal relationship uh, between our guests, um, the, the, the other patients. And so, and unfortunately, um, at least in many countries, uh, we do not give so much emphasis in the medical education uh, for the clinical communication. <clears throat> so um, we often learn by experience after we become doctors and um, the, um, the art of healing, um, you know, develops in this process, but many times the communication gives uh, difficulties as we go along. Um, the, um, you know, I, I was in the, as an MRCP examiner, um, the, in the UK, um, there was um, a lot of emphasis being given for the communication. In fact, in the exam, there is a station four, and uh, that is just communication. And uh, of different scenarios and difficult situations to the patients as well as their um, uh, relatives. And if uh, we fail in that communication um, uh, station, then we fail the whole exam and so much importance is given. So I think um, uh, everyone knows uh, how we um, have to develop further in this aspect in India, as well as in many countries. So we will be very eager to hear our esteemed speakers. Um, Dr. Um, no, uh, Dr. Yes, Dr. Eugene Nelson uh, is a professor of community and family medicine at the Giesel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, 
and the Dartmouth Institute of Health Policy and Clinical Practice. He has worked on in this area and his, um, uh, his work of developing the clinical value com compass and whole system measures to assess healthcare system performance has made him a well-recognized quality and value measurement uh, um, and value measurement expert. So certainly this is a, um, the clinical communication is a value measurement. So uh, we would be very uh, eager to hear from him how we can improve our clinical communication. And then Dr. Amelia Kulinan is, a, is an assistant professor at the Jesus School of Medicine and the director of uh, outpatient palliative care service at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Especially in oncology, the clinical communication is very important and, is, and that too in palliative care. And she leads the serious illness conversation, model of care implementation, uh, impl implementation project at D.H. Norris Cotton Cancer Center with a target of rolling out the SIC across the entire uh, center by 2023. And uh, so this is another aspect of communication and we will uh, learn many things from Dr. Amelia Kulinan. And um, with that introduction, and um, you know, I um, over to Dr. Eugene Nelson um, to start the, uh, his presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm very uh, delighted and honored to be here with you today. Uh, the, uh, the topic uh, that we'll be covering is uh, co-producing health, healthcare value and science, case concepts and conversations. Next slide. We start with a hypothesis, and that is that person-centered, registry-enabled learning health systems can successfully co-produce better health, better healthcare value, and better science by leveraging conversations and data. We'll provide some cases, some concepts, some evidence on impact, and then we're going to uh, really focus in on serious illness conversations. On the right-hand side is a picture of Wayne Gretzky, and uh, he scored more goals than anyone ever in the history of the National Hockey League. He was a Canadian from a small town in Western Canada. And when asked why he was able to score so many goals, he said it was because he was skating to where the puck is going to be. He was serious about that. And we believe that better conversations, as we'll be discussing, uh, as part of a learning system for health, is skating to where the puck is going to be. Next slide. We'll start with a case study uh, from Dartmouth. And uh, the founders of the Spine Center are pictured here. And in about 1998, they started a new system for providing comprehensive spine care. And uh, they also created a new information environment that uh, supported better conversations and better decisions. Next slide. If you were to visit the Spine Center, you'd be asked to complete a health assessment. And uh, that health assessment shows how that individual is doing in their health outcomes uh, and what their expectations for good care are. Next slide. That summary information um, is fed forward to their clinician, uh, physician, or another health professional. And that is used for a more sharp conversation about how the person's doing and choices and what to do next. Next slide. A dashboard uh, is made from that individual's health assessment. It took about 20 minutes. It takes, uh, still does about 20 minutes for a person to show their history and the review of systems, their risk factors, the history of their present illness, and then uh, very importantly, their health-related quality of life outcomes, physical functioning, mental health, role functioning, uh, pain, et cetera, and then uh, their disease status. 
uh, including where the points of pain are. And in the bottom center, there's actually an indication of how the outcomes are against their expectations for good results. So you have a, a, uh, your table set for a great conversation about how the individual's doing and what to do next. Next slide. This was part of a innovative system, uh, a learning system that uh, not only allowed you to look at disease status, functional status, and expectations for good care before and after at the individual patient and population level, it also fed into a registry uh, that was shared by 12 other centers, and it was part of a collaborative improvement and research network. This was based uh, again on the idea of feeding forward patient reported data for better conversations. Next slide. Here you're looking at um, what Dr. Sahadula mentioned earlier, a value compass. And this is for um, herniated disc outcomes, people that receive surgery, people that did not receive surgery, uh, in the 12 centers that were part of the spine center network. So after two years in a randomized controlled trial, uh, people that received herniated disc surgery are shown in blue, the blue bars, and those that elected for non-surgical care uh, or were randomized to non-surgical care is yellow. So we show here clinical outcomes on the uh, west direction, functional on the north direction, satisfaction with clinical improvement on the east direction, and total cost on south. And if you look at the length of the blue bar uh, with respect to the yellow bar, you'll see that in terms of disease status, clinical status west, the blue bar is longer than the yellow bar, indicating better clinical results for the patients after two years north functional results, physical function, better, the surgical patients receive better um, uh, physical function results. Uh, and also their satisfaction with their health benefit was greater. And when you go south for costs, you see that this greater improvement and better quality of life and better clinical outcomes did come at a pri higher price tag, $27,000 total uh, expenditures, indirect and direct costs, versus 13,000 and that translates into an extra $34,000 for quality adjusted life year. So that's an example of uh, using these um, patient reported outcomes to actually calculate value for individual patients. Next slide. Because uh, this information is then fed back to the centers for real time care, if I go to the spine center now and I'm faced with a decision, let's say I have spondylial thesis, there's a personalized risk calculator that can show me my chances of getting better or worse outcomes after two years if I elect surgical care to non-surgical care. And in this case, um, surgical care for people like me uh, tends to produce better results. 86, 86 out of 100 people improving uh, versus 55 out of 100 improving with non-surgical care. Next slide. This uh, program, this learning system for better conversations and better outcomes uh, resulted in over a hundred publications and uh, uh, that work continues today. It's a, uh, I think a good example of a first case of this idea of a learning system for co-producing better health based on better conversations. Next slide. In about um, the year 2000, and 2000, my friend Stefan Lindblad uh, was visiting me at Dartmouth. And we were talking uh, one afternoon about uh, healthcare. And I invited him to spend the next morning at the Dartmouth Spine Center to see what we were doing. Uh, Dr. Lindblad was the head uh, rheumatologist and the head of the Swedish Rheumatology Quality Register. Um, the next uh, afternoon, uh, Stefan, Dr. Lindblad was in my office and he said, you know that Spine Center is quite amazing and I think we could do this in Sweden. 
And he did do this in Sweden. Uh, so about uh, three or four years later, I went to the Karolinska Institute where uh, Stefan was based. And uh, I asked him, so how are things going? And uh, he drew this, next slide, he drew this uh, picture for me on a piece of paper. It was a triangle. He said, you know, Gene, this is what we really need to focus on. It's the partnership between our patients and ourselves, the physician and the patient, the clinician and the person who needs to benefit from our, our care and services. And you know what makes that partnership work? It's communication. Next slide. So if you were to visit the spine set, the, uh, the, a Swedish rheumatology practice today, and if you had rheumatoid arthritis, uh, this is what you would be doing. Uh, before seeing your rheumatologist, you would uh, complete a health assessment. Next slide. And that health assessment creates a self-management, home self-management module, uh, tracking your pain uh, points on the left and your disease activity on the right. Next slide. There's a clinician module so that that information is uh, transmitted to your clinician. And your clinician, uh, even without seeing the individual patient, can look at their clinical outcomes over time their patient reported outcomes over time against on the bottom, the different rheumatologic RA medications that are being taken. Next slide. So uh, when the patient visits a clinician, there's a dashboard and people learn uh, very quickly how to read their dashboard when they're visiting their uh, physician. And what this shows, uh, the columns are dates of visits and uh, the rows, the top rows are patient reported outcomes, the middle are clinical outcomes, and, um, and then combined and highlighted and colored, and then the medications are on the bottom. So we have time from left to right, we have outcomes, and then we have um, medications that people are on. And what was happening with this individual patient uh, was that um, between August and, uh, and December, uh, they had gone from um, uh, borderline flare to a full out exacerbation of their RA. Um, when their medication was changed from Remicade to Oricombi, the very bottom row, Rem and Ori, you'll see that the person went back into, by uh, April, the green zone. So back into um, arrested disease activity. Next slide. Uh, what this has done across all of Sweden is to cut in half the disease activity rate in virtually all of the rheumatoid arthritis patients in Sweden. The red line 2005 to 2014 shows disease activity at about 11.6% um, in 2005, dropping down to about 5%. Uh, 4% in 2014. That's the red trend for all of Sweden. What is happening in uh, the blue trend line is Gavle County. And when a new uh, physician became the head of rheumatology in Gavle County, Sven Tegmark, Sven said to his colleagues in Gavle County, you know that dashboard and that a uh, system for having better conversations that Stefan has been telling us about. I'd really like you to actually use it the way he's been suggesting with your patients. And uh, when they did, uh, you can see what happened, that they went from a very volatile um, uh, situation of disease activity to being much more stable and generally actually better outcomes than the rest of Sweden by using uh, this approach for better outcomes tracking to lead to better conversations, to lead to better decisions, to be, lead to better engagement in patients taking better care of themselves in partnership with their clinicians. Next slide. So we're into it. Um, now we're going to go a bit deeper after those first two cases.
Next slide. We're going to go into some concepts that are underlying this approach. And um, the story starts um, in about uh, 2013. And uh, I got an invitation from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to uh, import an innovation to the United States. And uh, my friend at the Johnson Foundation said, do you know, wanna know what this innovation is? And I said, yes, I, I'd like to know. And she said, well, we'd like to import the Swedish Rheumatology Quality Register uh, and see if we can make that work in the United States, that approach. And so um, we organized a team of people and uh, on October 16th, 2013, we had a meeting with about uh, 10 people from Sweden, including a patient uh, and patient advocate uh, and clinicians and Stefan Lindblad uh, from Sweden and a group of people from uh, the United States, uh, Paul Batalden, an eminent um, um, leader uh, worldwide in improvement and co-production. And as, uh, as Paul and I were talking the night before our meeting, uh, he said, why don't you drop a model for our brainstorming session tomorrow? Next slide. So um, we drew up a little model um, on October 16th. And on the left, it had to do with um, social system innovations and on the right uh, with technological innovations. And uh, along the top, uh, the label was patient-centered decision support for the co-production of good care and better health outcomes. Well, next slide. Um, and one further. When we started to um, make this model, uh, this conceptual model, it it uh, started to look like this. It focuses on this partnership uh, between a patient and the family on the left and joining with a clinician and their care team on the right. And when they're together, uh, forming a partnership for co-producing uh, better health. Next slide. Uh, that is based on an enriched information environment, such as you saw in the cases of the um, Sweden Rheumatology Registry and the Spine Center. Next slide. Uh, but there's more to it than that. There's a patient and family and caregiver support network that's part of the system. Next slide. Uh, next beep. There's a collaborative improvement and research network that's part of the system. Next. There is a registry that is enabled to feed back data, not only to the point of care, point in time over time, but also comparative performance feedback on results in different centers so that you can see how your center compares to others and take part in improvement and research programs. Uh, next click. And the point of this co-production learning health system for better health, value, and science mediated by better conversations is optimal health for the individual, high value health care, so that no money is wasted in getting the best results and better research on how to get best results most efficiently. Next slide. At the core of the model uh, is, uh, is this uh, information, this idea, click. First, there's co-assessing the patient's health status on how the treatment plan has been working and what to do to improve the patient's health and well-being, click. Co-deciding on what the next steps are in the patient's treatment plan based on relevant evidence and past experiencing experience to minimize the burden of disease, click. Co-designing the treatment plan with the patient for daily care and professional interventions to minimize the burden of treatment and click. And co-delivering the treatment plan, which usually involves daily self-management as well as occasional treatments and visits to their clinician. There are two experts in the room, the patient and the clinician. Next slide. So this has uh, been written up in some papers. This is one of them. Next slide. Um, we're 
uh, adapting this model in various populations in the US and abroad. Next slide. At the, at the core of this uh, conceptual model are two big ideas. One is co-production and the next is uh, learning systems, learning health systems. Next slide. Co-production, uh, the term was popularized by a Nobel laureate, Eleanor Ostrom from Indiana. And she uh, studied the creation of public services, uh, public good services. And what she concluded uh, based on the evidence is that co-production can create services that are more efficient and effective and sustainable uh, rather than raw competition. There are conditions under which co-production wins. Next slide. And here, uh, this is Paul Batalden uh, with a quote, all healthcare services at some level are co-produced. You step back and you think about healthcare and self-management, et cetera, and the reality of, of co-production of healthcare for health. Next slide. Uh, here's a formal definition of co-production, the interdependent work of patients and professionals to design, deliver, assess, and improve the relationships and actions that contribute to the health of individuals and populations through mutual respect and partnership that leverages each participant's unique assets, expertise, and actions. Next slide. Uh, learning health systems, learning organizations. Peter Senge really uh, popularized this idea about learning organizations that need to continually improve their capacity to create the results that are truly desired, where new and expansive patterns of thinking are nurtured, collective aspiration is set free, people are continually learning to see the whole, to see the whole together. Next slide. This idea uh, in healthcare was popularized by the Institute of Medicine uh, in our country. And this is a formal definition of a learning health system applying and a learning health system generates and applies the best evidence for collaborative healthcare choices of each patient and provider and drives the process of discovery as a natural outgrowth growth of patient care. Next slide. Um, so does this work? Uh, three quick examples, and then I'm going to pass the, the baton. Uh, from cardiac surgery, cystic fibrosis, and rheumatoid arthritis, does this conceptual model work? Next slide. Uh, this is the Northern New England Cardiovascular Study Group. And um, in, uh, just, uh, eight, uh, in just eight years, uh, they were able to drop open heart surgery mortality rate in 1987 to uh, 1995 from about four and a half percent to three and a half percent. That trend uh, you see here continued to 2003 and it's continued thereafter. Uh, next slide. That's one of the earliest examples of this approach. This is a cystic fibrosis learning system. Uh, 10 year gain in life expectancy from 1990 to 2012. 10 year gain in life expectancy. This was before biologics came in. Last slide. This is the Swedish Rheumatology Quality Register bringing the results up to 2017. You can see that that downward trend continued, um, got uh, at 3% uh, by 2017 uh, disease activity. Next slide. And here we're passing the baton uh, to uh, Dr. Cullinan to focus in uh, more extensively on this approach in general and crucial conversations in particular. Amelia. Thank you so much. So what I'd like to show you is the work that we've done in our cancer center um, involving the serious illness conversation to bring this um, powerful idea to life uh, at Dartmouth. So um, we were given an opportunity to do this work because our institution um, wished to create, deliver on our strategic promise, which you see listed here. Um, and 
we were fortunate to be part of a collaboration, not just between our cancer center and our institution, but also the Dartmouth Institute. So we had three powerful organizations coming together with core common goals. The goal of our work is to improve not just the patient experience, but also the healthcare team's experience and to really co-produce and co-design care from the bedside to the bench, to the boardroom in full partnership with patients and families at every step along the way. So this um, institutional work has a number of facets to it. Um, as you can see, the serious illness conversation is over here on the left, and that's what I'll be focusing on. But I wanted you to be aware that there is a scope of work, which I'll speak about some of these elements a little bit later. Um, which has a goal of trying to deliver on our institution's strategic promise. So in addition to the serious illness conversation model of care, there is patient wisdom and point of care dashboards, which support a superb patient experience in which patients are meaningfully and respectfully included in decisions regarding their health. We are developing peer-to-peer -peer facilitated support networks, which will partner with community and advocacy groups to connect care partners to peer support and trusted resources. We have a data measurement and scholarship working group, which will contribute to support a data and research infrastructure uh, to facilitate a robust and transparent communication of outcomes and the creation and translation of new knowledge. And finally, we have a collaborative learning network across the bottom, which creates a learning culture for clinicians, staff, and patients. Everyone a teacher and continuous learner, where we come together to learn, measure, share, and improve together. So as I said, in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the serious illness conversation. What is the serious illness conversation? So Ariadne Labs, which um, has been led and was founded by Atul Gawande, uh, himself a physician interested in healthcare improvement. The, the conversation guide was developed because it occurred to experts who take care of seriously ill patients that while palliative care clinicians are very good at working magic and suddenly figuring out what patients' values and goals are, it wasn't something that could easily be disseminated across different specialties and other kinds of physicians. So the idea was, can we make it easy for clinicians of all types to elicit seriously ill patients' values and goals before complications happen. So in the course of developing this guide, in addition to bringing together experts in different serious health, serious illness care fields, also patients and families were involved. And this guide is now on, I think, over a hundred iterations. It's been iteratively improved over time. When the guide has Excuse me, I apologize <laughs> for, some, for some reason that's doing something odd. So when the guide has been studied in um, oncology and high-risk primary care settings, you can see that conversations happened uh, earlier, up to four months earlier, increased in frequency, and were retrievable in the EMR. Clinicians who used the guide were more likely to elicit actionable goals and values from patients. And although we tend to think that goals of care conversations upset patients, conversations using the guide actually reduce patient's anxiety and the benefit was sustained out to 24 weeks. Patient, patients report uh, enacting meaningful behavior changes. So that the, they said that the discussion had impacted not just their medical care, but their personal lives as well. So our goal, so now that I've described the serious illness conversation to you, I wanted to give you a sense of what our project was at Dartmouth. So our goal is to systematically increase conversations between oncology teams and seriously ill patients before complications arise, before they land in the hospital, before they're on their last line of treatment. But also we wanted the conversations to feel efficient for, for, the, for the healthcare team, we wanted them to be high quality conversations and we wanted our healthcare teams to feel that the experience was rewarding. We wanted our patients and families to feel that the experience was rewarding. We wanted to make goals of care conversations normal work. So as you can see, our goal is to spread this across our cancer center and, uh, over the next few years. We began with head and neck and sarcoma. 
So thinking about this idea of efficiency, the guide itself is an efficient tool. Uh, the median time for conversation when run by physicians is 22 minutes, by nurses, 26 minutes. And it's efficient because the load or the work of the conversation can be distributed across the healthcare team. It does not depend solely upon a physician having it. And in the healthcare in the United States, we have the ability to bill for these conversations so that that reduces in some, in some way the burden on the system of concern about I'm spending too much time on this conversation. We also are able to increase the efficiency of this conversation in our, in our healthcare system by having a centralized place in our electronic medical record where this conversation is documented and then can be easily found. There's a home for this conversation and it, that for it's not buried in a progress note somewhere. So that if a patient gets admitted to the hospital, the hospital team knows where to find the patient's goals and values quickly. We also try to improve the quality of conversations by having them earlier. So this graph depicts the functional status of a cancer patient from diagnosis to death in within two years. And it indicates key clinical events such as clinic visits, hospitalizations, and a new line of treatment. So where should a serious illness conversation take place? We think that in some disease groups, it's within the first three to four visits after diagnosis, begin early. And hopefully it happens before something like a hospitalization occurs when the conversation can then be revisited, which is a much easier task than trying to talk about goals and values when someone's stressed and scared because things are getting worse. We also make sure that this having uh, disseminated this across the cancer center does not mean that palliative care stops seeing patients or stops having these conversations. The idea is that there are, instead of just having conversations for that small um, burgundy triangle here at the top, we're actually making our triangle bigger. We're having more conversations and only the most complex will come to our specialty service. So our recipe for this implementation project, because we know that education about communication only goes so far. So we wanted to have an implementation effort to make sure that these behaviors became, became normal work. So with, with this model of care, as you can see, right, we know that at its heart, uh, a conversation between a clinician and a healthcare team, that's the most important thing. But we know that we need more than just a conversation um, to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our healthcare teams and our patients and our families. So as I go through, I'll be hearkening back to this learning health system model. So the details of our implementation where we began with a team, and these, this is our clinical team. We had physicians, nurse practitioners, a scheduling secretary, we had social workers, we had different nurses of different types, we had a QI specialist, we had a patient and family advisor here over here on the left, Andy. His wife died of cancer several years ago. He was there to advise us from a patient and family perspective. So we had nine different experts in this room. Um, and we trained everyone in the serious illness conversation, including our scheduling secretary. They all needed to know what this conversation had to do with, right? We trained our physicians and advanced and, um, and the folks who are going to be having conversations in how to document these conversations and in how to bill for them. And when they were learning how to have the conversation, I used a standard pre and debriefing technique to boost clinicians' confidence and to help them learn from the work that they had just done so that they could be better at the conversation the next time. So one-to-one -one coaching. And we co-designed our eligibility criteria, identified barriers or key drivers and change ideas to help us achieve our aim. And we co-designed workflows. So we followed a very standard quality improvement method in trying to make this conversation normal work for these teams. So here, here's what we did over the last year. So starting in January, um, what you can see is uh, you are this, this run chart 
track serious illness conversations conducted in head and neck and sarcoma in our cancer center starting in January 2020 and ending this, this chart ends December 3rd, 2020. The desired direction of our aim was up. The y-axis was our main outcome measure, the percentage of conversations completed. And the x-axis is the number of eligible patients plotted by weekly over time. Our definition of an eligible patient is someone that the team would not be surprised if they died in the next two years. The red line was our initial SMART aim goal of 25%, and the purple line is our median. So note that our baseline, the percentage of conversations, began at zero. Few conversations were being performed or documented. And our first four PDSA cycles were focused on team formation. Um, during which time, obviously, our baseline remained zero, but we began to see movement upward in the conversation, in the percentage of conversations completed after mapping and improving our workflow and then providing expert coaching for conversations. Once we got to PDSA 7 and began sharing our data, not surprisingly, our team became competitive and wanted to have more conversations and see that number go up. Um, they began to question, though, how are we going to do even better than our 26, 33%. And they decided to in, in, include some um, PDSA cycles involving um, scheduling conversations for identified patients, such as a, a scheduling script, um, also incorporating the voice of our patients in scheduling, where they would want to have it and how they'd want to have it. And, and you can see that our, our uh, percentage skyrocketed up to 67%. So the team now is really focused, its work is on uh, maintaining the gains that they've made, but really the conversation has become part of their normal cultural experience. So uh, in October, as part of this uh, care and quality improvement network that you see here on this left, uh, our team was part of a learning collaborative where we came back together to talk about the work that we've done and reflected on our lessons learned. And so this is gonna tell you a little bit about the way that this work impacted our team. So we had this lovely exercise where we talked about what we had liked and learned and what we thought the process had lacked and surprise moments. And here are some of the things that the team shared. One, having a family advisor involved in our work reduced the clinician's barriers to starting conversations. They felt like patients don't wanna talk about this, it will upset patients. But of course our family advisor, his experience had been that it was really helpful that we started talking about this early. So that really mattered to our team. Another thing that the team shared was that when they had conversations earlier, the clinicians felt more confident about their ability to deliver high quality care. They felt like they were on solid footing, they felt confident. Um, they felt like they were less likely to be extrapolating or guessing about what a patient would want, and they knew what the patient wanted because they had talked about it. They also talked, they, it also had reframed their perspective on what their role was, that they weren't just about delivering chemotherapy, but that they were about finding out what was important to a patient as they were living with this illness. And finally, the actual work of being part of a learning health system created a feeling of team equity, growth mindset, and engagement. They really valued this experience. So imagine broadening the inter intervention beyond just our implementation, beyond having conversations. So imagine that before a patient even came to an oncology visit, that they had had a chance to fill out a pre-visit agenda setting tool in which they told us what they wanted to talk about during that visit. And they had a menu of options that could say, these are things that are okay to, to discuss here. And what if as a result of that, the patient told us when they wanted to have this conversation, right? This, is, uh, this agenda setting tool is something that we are developing for our palliative care clinic and intend to disseminate across the cancer center over time as well. Having filled this out, this agenda setting tool then feeds forward into a dashboard just as Jean was describing earlier. Only this is a serious illness dashboard and it's populated with the patient's goals, with the, the symptoms that they're having right now tracked over time. It's populated with 
previous conversations that they've had. And it includes the agenda setting items that they've said that they wanted to discuss for this visit, but that this is a shared space for the patient and the healthcare team to actually engage in this work of the visit together. Imagine that this patient before they even came to you that their caregivers were fully supported and felt like they had their emotional and informational needs met through a support network because we know that the caregiver experience is exhausting and requires independent support. And of course, imagine that every healthcare clinician, clinical team was supported by learning about registries, about what was happening in other healthcare systems so that they could always be improving, always be getting better and comparing themselves to other teams to see what, what, what could we be doing better. So in conclusion, Good conversations at their heart really do echo upwards in meta levels so that co-production and communication are such a, such a similar theme. And we believe that they can improve health, healthcare value and, silent, and, and science. I wanna thank all of you for this time and we appreciate your uh, interest. Thank you, Eugene and Amelia. I think um, that was, um, I learned a lot of things. It's not really about conversation and how to measure it. And uh, the clinical value compass, um, definitely we all know that patient engagement and uh, the conversation, the communication definitely um, brings out better patient outcomes and uh, better patient experience. And that partnership through communication between the physician and the uh, patient um, is a wonderful and um, it's now communication is uh, with the family, not really with the patient. And um, sometimes we call, it's not patient rounds, we call it family rounds now. And um, so I think that's what, and Dr. Amelia, you know, I think uh, what's the importance of learning health system in oncology and uh, the serious illness conversation, um, very interesting and how documenting it, and it has to be made into a work culture, and um, finally, connect, share, and care. And I think um, excellent um, ideas which came out of this uh, discussion. I have a few minutes for uh, questions, and there are a number of questions. I can catch up a few, and um, 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 I, I may just go ahead, and um, one of you could take it. What are the clinical communication barriers in healthcare? Um, uh, would you like to take, uh, take Eugene? Uh, the question was clinic, clinical clinic communication barriers. Yes. Um, I think the first one uh, starts uh, really with the patients and that uh, when I was a little boy, I would go to see Dr. Abbott and uh, I was um, uh, pretty much there to listen and to follow my doctor's instructions. Uh, it wasn't, um, I wasn't trained. Uh, I wasn't expected to say much. And uh, although I was a little boy, I think that carries forward a lot that we, we, uh, we grew up in a system where uh, patients were, um, were asked to give their problem. And then the, the clinician uh, was asked to solve the problem. And uh, so a lot of the uh, barrier starts with encouraging, making it possible for the patient to bring forward uh, in their own words, their goals and concerns so that we can work on this together. Yep. Um, thank you. Uh, could you also comment uh, pediatric patient communication during this COVID-19 impacted world? Amelia, would you like to uh, address that? Yeah, Amelia. Yeah. I'd be happy to. I think the same principles that apply to adult communication are true in pediatrics. And I think that um, the conversation is broader because you're including the uh, parents as guides to help the patient be able to articulate their values. Um, and I think that a critical piece of good communication um, is the use of empathy. 
I think that in this time of COVID, people are scared, rightfully so. And so I think healthcare providers using verbal empathy um, is a critical way of assuring that patients and families feel understood and cared for. Yeah, um, Amelia, could you also comment? Is the patient-centered registry model similar to the concept of value-driven outcome? Jean, I wonder actually if this might be a better question for you to answer. Yes, the, the answer is yes, uh, that um, value-driven uh, care, uh, if we start to think about what value is and define it as, um, as something that um, is, a, is based on uh, clinical outcomes and uh, patient functional outcomes and the patient's experience of care with their clinicians and their perceived health benefit, uh, all of that in relationship to cost. Um, I, I think we have um, uh, a, uh, an overlap of, of ideas and terms and certainly of, of concepts. Um, Akio, one more um, question. Akio, uh, thank you for the great presentation. Do you have any standardized education program to foster shared information environment for both care providers and patients? And how do you encourage to have that in, in a community level? Jean, do you want me to take that one? Please. Do you want me to repeat it? No, okay. I, I can see it in the Q&A. So yeah, this, okay. conver this conversation guide that I presented to you, and I encourage interested people to go to ariadnelabs.org. Um, this conversation guide is freely available on the internet. Um, and I believe as a well-designed tool, it's not just helpful for clinicians to use, but patients and families can download it and then use it to guide their own thinking on their own. So it is non-threatening language and it really helps patients and families to be able to distill out what's most important. So I believe that this tool could be used even in the most simple of manners um, to disseminate into community. But we have also used it as an educational tool for medical trainees. Let me add to that as well that uh, one of our close colleagues, uh, Dr. Glenn Elwin, uh, is um, uh, an international expert on shared decision making. And um, actually, I believe he'll be presenting to this group uh, later on this year. He has something called a three talk model uh, that applies to um, primary care and basically any situation that he uses uh, to uh, teach people uh, how to have uh, very good conversations that allow uh, the patient's preferences and shared decision making to be built into regular visits. It's called the three talk model. It's been published. And I think you'll hear about it uh, in the future. All right, thank you very much. I think, um, sorry about some of the questions, uh, but um, you, you have answered and there were some duplications. And um, for the speakers, um, thank you um, indeed, uh, Eugene and Amelia. Uh, that was a very good um, learning conversation. And, um, um, thank you, um, you know, Vijay and uh, Dr. Ravindranath. Uh, Ravindranath also, thank you. I didn't uh, wish you earlier. Um, thank you very much. And all the um, um, expected, I mean, all the audience, I was, uh, uh, it was a privilege for me to address and be part of this. Over to Dr. Lalu uh, to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lu. Thank you very much, Dr. Eugene and Amelia for taking the time and for enlightening us with clin clinical communication in challenging situations. As a token of love and appreciation from us, we wish to present certificates to the two of you. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Saradullah, for taking your time and for moderating the session very well. Thank you, Dr. Eugene, Dr. Amelia, Dr. Saradullah, and our dear friend, Dr. Professor Ravindra Jagasoti, Dr. Anuradha Pichimani, and all the participants who have joined us today evening. Have a very good evening. Good day to all of you.